my preaching through 1 John. And so we are up at John, 1 John chapter 3, and I'd like to begin with verse 10, 1 John chapter 3. But just before I read that, I'd like to read a portion of scripture from Genesis. And this is the account of Cain murdering Abel. Adam was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. Then she also gave birth to his brother Abel. Abel became a shepherd of the flocks, but Cain worked the ground. In the course of time, Abel presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flocks and their fat portions. The Lord had regard to Abel, uh, to Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious, and he looked despondent. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious, and why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not what is right, now get this phrase, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. That's a good statement for us all to take to heart. Could it ever be in our life that sin is crouching at the door? Its desire is for you, but must, you must rule over it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Now what we have here is an account of how jealousy and envy took a hold of Cain's heart because of the different way that his offering was accepted by the Lord. Cain looked at that and he desired that very thing that he did not get. And so this caused him to be filled with envy and a bit of jealousy, and I know what that feels like. I've had feelings like that before. I can struggle with those kinds of feelings. But the Lord warned Cain about this time about his vulnerability to do something much worse. And this phrase of sin crouching at the door is kind of unique. It's different kind of terminology than any place else in scripture I picture it as sin is right outside the door and if we open the door there it is and it can take over our life now I don't know that Cain intended at the first to kill his brother isn't it a sad scenario that the first two brothers that ever lived upon the face of the earth one brother killed the other one what a start Scripture says he was furious, he killed his brother. We're going to look at two natures today. Now, I've called this the contrast of Christian love, but it actually is a contrast of natures. So, beginning with verse 10, 1 John chapter 3, this is how God's children and the devil's children are made evident. Please note, God's children, and then John actually uses the term the devil's children. And some people think that's very strong, but the Lord used the same terminology. The Lord himself called people the devil's children. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Unlike Cain, 
And here's the reference that led me to just to brush up again a little bit on Cain and Abel. Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother, and why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brother, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that's referenced from the Sermon on the Mount. You remember we studied the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible. Jesus said if you even think about your brother with malice in your heart, you pretty much the same as murdered him. Charles Spurgeon says if you think of someone else in regards to you wouldn't even like to have them around you at all, that you in a sense have all the attributes of murder in your heart without the action, but it's still there. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we've come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay our, down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has this world's goods and sees his brothers in need, but closes his eye to his need, how can the love of God reside in him? Little children, we must not love with word or speech, but with truth and action. I try to think of love as a verb. Love is an action. When we love someone, we are doing something to display or show our love. This is how we will know we belong to the truth and convince our conscience in his presence, even if our conscience condemns us, that God is greater than our conscience and he knows all things. Dear friends, if our conscience doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God and can receive whatever we ask from him because we keep his commandments and do what is pleasing in his sight. Now this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commands remains in him and he in him and the way we know that he remains in us is from the spirit he has given us. So the two natures of mankind there is the human fallen nature, which is our inheritance from our ancestor Adam, who sinned before God, and everyone after that has had the sinful nature within us as an inheritance of Adam. I have a sinful nature because of my father. My two, three sons have a sinful nature because of me. And then at the same time, when we become a Christian, then we begin to have a spiritual godly nature. And these two are actually within us all the time. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 says, there is a natural body, there is the original person who has the sin nature and is prone to do things even like Cain did as he murdered his brother Abel out of jealousy. Any of us is prone. Someone has said something like it is beyond the capacity of people to understand or know the potential of the human heart toward evil. Now, that's a very sobering assessment. To think that a human heart has the potential for great evil, and I think we can sort of verify that, as we have seen a lot of tragedies in our land. John has already called some the children of God. Here in chapter 3, verse 1, 
Look how great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. So that's a great title, to be called the children of God. But here God, John distinguishes between the children of God and the children of the devil. It is not accurate, no matter how good it sounds, it certainly sounds like a Sunday school theme, to say that everyone is a child of God. We're all children of God. I have heard uh, Sunday school teachers say that about the children. And I understand what they're trying to say. They're trying to affirm to the children that God loves them as a father would love a child. We are sometimes accustomed to thinking that everyone is God's children while being a child of God has a nice sound to it, Jesus himself called some servants of the devil in John 8, 44. Jesus said, ye are of your father the devil when he was talking to some of the Pharisees. So he actually called the Pharisees the children of the devil. We should be clear that there are two natures, the corruptible evil nature or tendency that any of us could have, and there is the spiritual godly nature that we have as Christians. And my prayer for my own life is that my human nature that comes from me as an inheritance from the first Adam will diminish in its effect in my life. And that the spiritual godly nature will increase now that is my inheritance from what the bible calls the second adam have you ever heard jesus christ called the second adam so we have an inheritance from the first adam which is our sin nature and if we have accepted christ as savior now we have the inheritance of the second adam jesus which is our spiritual nature as the Holy Spirit has come into our very lives and is a part of us. I would hope that all of us could sort of consciously be aware that we have the Holy Spirit within us that's always speaking to our hearts. I think he speaks to us much more than I'm aware. When I'm doing things that doesn't please God, I am following my sinful nature and a lot of times I am well aware of what I'm doing even when I do it I know that this particular mindset or thought is not pleasing to God but sometimes my sinful nature will sort of override or cause me to continue in the thinking I was thinking last week how often am I almost uh, inadvertently envious of someone else? How often do I compare myself to others? Boy, that always gets me in trouble. I mean, when I compare myself to someone else, in my own mind, I feel like I always come up short. It's like this other person, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. And then I turn back and look at me, and, oh, boy, oh, boy, look at this. And... And I am comparing myself to others. And you know, really, that gets me in trouble. Now, these two natures are in us. And the closest thing I can think about how to illustrate this, a friend of mine in Harrisonburg, or in Briary Branch there, he was good at grafting fruit trees. He grafted an apple tree and that apple tree then actually produced two different types of apples from the same tree. Because he grafted a limb, a branch, into the tree itself. And there's a certain technique for doing that. Slipping the one branch sort of into the other one a certain way. Sealing it up. And what do you know? In time, that branch will continue to live from the parent tree, you might say. And if he grafted in a different type of apple from 
uh, the other apple tree that the tree is doing, it'll then produce two different types of apples, one from this limb that he grafted in and the other was from the original. The Bible says that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. We have been grafted in to Christ Jesus and therefore we have a new nature within us now. Yes, the sin nature can still be there, but our new nature hopefully is grafted from the vine of Jesus Christ and we can become a new person, have a new nature. John clearly defines a child of God. He says there's two characteristics of a child of God. Number one, we should love one another. And he says that we know we have passed from life to death because we love our brothers, verse 14. The one who does not love remains in death. But when we love our brothers, we are displaying a new nature that we can have. Now, Charlie Brown told Lucy one time, I want to be a doctor. And Lucy told Charlie Brown back, you can't be a doctor. You don't love your fellow man. And Charlie Brown says, yes, I love my fellow man. It's just the people I don't like. <laughs> and sometimes I think that's the attitude I can have sometimes. Well, yes, the Lord, you know I love everyone. But boy, I sure have a problem with this person. And you know, if you run from one place to another to get away from someone, you'll run into the same person somewhere else. Now, not exactly the same person, but the same type of person. They're everywhere. And I have to think, do I truly love people the way a Christian should? Now, the Bible then says the second thing, we love one another... And then down in verse 18, it qualifies that love some. It says, little children, we must not love with word or speech. Now, only, word or speech only, but with truth and action. Now, this is how I really enjoy the love, that I have a chance to have some type of action toward that person. And that's why I love to go on disaster trips. I was not the best at doing some of the work. One time I drywalled a room and I used five gallon of drywall mud to do one room. And of course I had to sand for two days to get the drywall mud back off the wall. So I wasn't that good, but it just gave me a good feeling to know that I'm doing something to help someone. Didn't even know who they were, didn't have to know them. Sometimes we got to meet them but not often. And so I can tell that I have both natures within me. And I believe that it's good for all of us to recognize that when these two natures are in us, they will battle one another. The Bible says there is a fleshly nature, there is a spiritual nature, and these two are at enmity with one another. These two will f actually fight. An Indian person says, I have two dogs fighting within me. And someone said, which dog wins? He says, the one I feed the most. And it's a little bit like that with our natures. The one that's going to win is the one we feed the most. I believe it's good to recognize that there's a spiritual battle within us. And I'm going to tell you that I have spiritual battles in my life. And I know what some of you might say, and you're the preacher, what? Well, I think the preacher can have the most fears of battle sometimes. Let me recommend, without getting too deep in the subject, but recommend a book that is entitled Every Man's Battle. Winning the War on Sexual Temptation. What did he say? Every Man's Battle... Winning the War on Sexual Temptation by Steve Otterburn. You can buy it from Amazon for $10. If you get on the computer today, you'll have it by Tuesday. And if you don't have it, I recommend you doing that. Yes, I battle with temptation in lots of areas, and I need to recognize that. 
The one who commits sin is of the devil, and I don't want to go down the road of temptation, which will lead to more, which will lead to more. It's quite a mistake to believe that we can just barely tip over the line in temptation and be all right. I occasionally lust after someone's vehicle. Let me tell you. Now, I have not had too many vehicles that anybody's going to lust after. <laughs> Quite often, I take an assessment, and I have the oldest vehicle in the lot. My trick is that when you have older vehicles, you have to have at least three or four, and most of the time, at least one of them is running. And that works pretty well. Now, back in when Joel was in high school, when he was in the band, he the band would go to competitions and have a lot of equipment to take with them. They had so much equipment they could hardly haul it. And I was able to secure a 40 foot, 48 foot tractor and trailer. I was able to borrow a tractor and trailer from a trucking company and haul the equipment for the band to their competitions. Oh, my, was I not a proud person. We pull into those competitions, and I pull in in a big truck with all of our band equipment. And they, they had their puny little trailers, and I come in the big truck. And I was so proud. You know what? It didn't take long to happen. Another band one day pulled in a big truck, too. And their trailer was all painted up with their band's name and everything on the side of it. I didn't have that on mine. We just had a regular old trailer. And the truck was pretty, but they had an awful pretty truck too. And all of a sudden, I wasn't quite as proud. You know what? Because no matter what we have, it don't take long to find somebody that has something better. And now I'm still envying what they have. John clearly defines the child of Satan here, too. He says, they don't do what is right. And this statement causes me to pause. Do I care for others the way I really should? Am I doing enough? Oh, I'm doing a little. And I know you can't save the whole world. But God puts certain opportunities in front of me, I believe, and probably does in front of most of us, certain opportunities that we can help. And it's more than just holding a door open for somebody at Walmart, although that's all right too. But there are opportunities that I have, and I believe a child of God tries to take advantage of some of the opportunities that God puts in front of us. I don't know what opportunities you might have this coming week to help someone in particular. A child of Satan is conformed to the world, where a child of God is conformed to what God is doing in all of our lives. Now, John declares here, and it's not negative, but he declares that all of us can be a child of God. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he has commanded those. We can be a child of God. Let us recognize the two natures. Godly living in relationship with Jesus Christ ensures that we indeed are a child of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I definitely in my heart want to be able to be a child of God. And I believe by faith I am, yet I recognize that within me there is another nature that dwells. But I pray that I will not be in bondage to any of these other ways, but Lord, that I might be wholly susceptible to your spirit within me that will help the true nature of godliness and the spiritual nature that's within me to come out and be the person I really am. I pray that 
In Jesus' name, amen.